Good morning, brothers and sisters. Am I coming in loud and clear? Yes, <clears throat> loud and clear, Pastor. Amen. Thank you, Pastor John. Our, uh, the Lord's uh, message for this morning is all about the Good Samaritan. And uh, before we start, I would like to greet everyone a happy Hearts Day in advance for tomorrow. And the Lord bless this day in our hearts. In the last 15 chapters of the book of Luke, some of them cannot be found in Matthew, Mark, and John. And one of them is the story of the Good Samaritan. This is a popular parable and probably the most familiar of all the parables that Jesus taught. It is so popular that even people that are not schooled in the Bible are familiar with this. Secular sociologists even refer to this parable as a way to do good deeds and helping people who are in need. It is not primarily about that. No, not primarily about doing good deeds and helping people who are in need. If you think that it is all about doing good deeds and helping people who are in need, if you think that way, you're going to miss the element of this story. There is a deeper meaning into this, especially when we see the question that was asked of Jesus. So we will be reading Luke chapter 10, verses 25 to 37. Luke chapter 10, verses 25 to 37. On one occasion, an expert in the law stood up to test Jesus. Teacher, he asked, what must I do to inherit eternal life? So this is the question that sets the pace, that sets the tone of the message. Verse 26, what is written in the law? He replied, how do you read it? This is Jesus replying. Verse 27. The expert in the law answered, Love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your strength and with all your mind. And love your neighbor as yourself. You have answered correctly, Jesus replied. Do this and you will leave. But he wanted to justify himself. So he asked Jesus, and who is my neighbor? Verse 30. In reply, Jesus said, a man was going down from Jerusalem to Jericho when he fell into the hands of robbers. They stripped him of his clothes, beat him, and went away, leaving him half dead. A priest happened to be going down the same road, and when he saw the man, he passed by on the other side. So too, a Levite, when he came to the place and saw him, passed by on the other side. But a Samaritan, as he traveled, came where the man was, and when he saw him, he took pity on him. He went to him and bandaged his wounds, pouring on oil and wine. Then he put the man on his own donkey, took him to an inn, and took care of him. The next day, he took out two silver coins and gave them to the innkeeper. Look after him, he said, and when I return, I will reimburse you for any extra expense you may have. Which of these three do you think was a neighbor 
to the man who fell into the hands of robbers. The expert in the law replied, the one who had mercy on him. Jesus told him, go and do likewise. Let us pause there and pray. Almost gracious Heavenly Father, we truly lift up your name this morning, Lord, as we will be hearing your message this morning. Lord, thank you for preserving your eternal words into our hearts. Thank you, Lord, for opening our hearts, Lord, so that we can be receptive in everything that you will be teaching us. Continue to hold and mold us, Lord, so that we will be according to your image and to your likeness. And thank you so much, Lord, for this very wonderful message that this is, again, a, a new, fresh revelation coming from your words, Lord. Help us, Lord, to meditate on your words and continue to give us your wisdom, Lord, so that we can interpret this rightfully, Lord, according to your will and according to your words. We just want to praise you and give glory to you for this wonderful morning for all of us here at Livestream. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. There is actually a law in the country about the Good Samaritan. And it varies from jurisdiction to jurisdiction. But basically, this law is to protect you when you render aid to any stranger in need. Why do we need this protection? You may ask yourself, why do we need this protection? Let's say we went out on a dinner and we saw a woman on the next table choking and cannot breathe. She, she ate steak and a piece of the steak was lodged into her throat, on her throat. So what do you do? You spring into action. You do the hind leg maneuver. Pop out the meat on her throat. Save her life. But in the process of doing that, you broke a few of her ribs. You were doing the Heinrich too violently. Under this law, she cannot sue you for damages because this law protects anyone who are doing aid or assistance in time of need. But there is also in eight states here in America, in eight states here in America, a law by the same name, but with a different meaning. In these eight states, in these eight states, here a law by this, in these eight states, you have this duty to render aid. And if you don't, you will be held criminally liable for not rendering aid. In three of those eight, Florida, Ohio, and Washington State, you will have to at least call 911 or else you will be criminally liable. In the five other states, in Massachusetts, Rhode Island, Minnesota, Vermont, and Wisconsin, you will have to personally render the aid or else you will be held criminally liable. Remember those five states. You will be held criminally liable in Massachusetts, Rhode Island, Minnesota, Vermont, and Wisconsin. If you are there and you saw someone choking and you did not do it yourself, you will be held criminally liable. California is not on the list, so uh, you don't have to worry about here in California. But as a Christian, we should be doing that 
as a Christian. We should be doing that, saving a life of a person. So let's just explain the story before going to our three points a little bit later. As Jesus and his disciples were on the way to Jerusalem, they had an encounter with this unnamed expert in the law. So in, in, in one version, it says that this, this guy is a lawyer. So we'll just name him as a lawyer. Uh, he may be a scribe, but he is an expert in the Mosaic law. He is not a, an ordinary lawyer that we used to think today, like the criminal lawyer or, or uh, the immigration lawyer. He's not like that. But during those days, this lawyer is an expert in the Mosaic law, meaning the first five books of the Bible, the first five books, the Pentateuch. So this man approaches Jesus with a question. What must I do to inherit eternal life? So as he, we have read a while ago in verse 25, this is the question. So this sets the tone to the whole parable. Please take note that as a, as a side note, this same question was also asked by the same, by the rich ruler in Luke chapter 18, verse 18. The parable of the rich ruler, when he said in Luke 18, 18, uh, asking Jesus, uh, what must I do to inherit eternal life? So this is the approach of most people. What must I do? What must I do? I must do something. I must do something. So every world religion is always about doing something. That is what world religion is. Always you have to do something except Christianity. Because Christianity teaches us that it was already done for us. It was already done for us that Jesus died on the cross for our sins and that it is by grace that we are saved through our faith in what Jesus did. So the question was about eternal life. But Jesus answered him with another question. In fact, two questions. So Jesus answered the question with another two questions. In verse 26, Jesus asked, what is written in the law? How do you read it? So that is the two questions that Jesus asked of the lawyer. What is written in the law? How do you read it? As an expert in the law, he should know the law. He should know the law. And the guy answered Jesus, quoting two Verses from the Old Testament, which is found in Deuteronomy chapter 6, verse 5, and in Leviticus chapter 19, verse 18. In Deuteronomy chapter 6, verse 5, mentions that love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your strength, and with all your mind. And in Leviticus chapter 19, verse 18, Love your neighbor as yourself. So that is how the lawyer answered Jesus. And then Jesus replied in verse 28. You have answered correctly. Do this and you will live. You have answered correctly. Do this and you will live. Didn't you notice anything in verse 28, I may, may I ask you that what did you notice in verse 28? This is an interesting answer from Jesus when he said that you have answered correctly, do this and you will live. This is a very interesting answer. We might think about what happened with the four spiritual laws. What happened with with the four spiritual laws that says repent, confess, believe, 
and receive. So that is all about the four spiritual laws. What happened to that? Why does it have to be only uh, to be loved the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your mind, with all your soul, with all your strength, and love your neighbor as yourself? So Jesus, as if Jesus is making an allowance for a work-based salvation. As if Jesus is making an allowance for a work-based salvation. Do this, do that, and you're good to go. We know that Jesus didn't mean that. We all know that. That Jesus didn't really, did not really mean that. Because it will be contrary to everything else in the gospel. That will be contrary to everything else in the gospel. But why did Jesus said that? Why did Jesus said that? Here's why Jesus said that. Jesus said that to get the guy to realize that while loving God and loving people is the ambition in our hearts, but in reality, is if eternal life is based on how perfectly we love God, that is with every fiber in our being, meaning our heart, our soul, our strength, our mind, and also if eternal life is based on how perfectly we love people as ourselves. Let me repeat. If eternal life is based on how we perfectly love God and love people as ourselves, we will all be doomed. We will all be doomed. We will all be in trouble. Everyone will be in trouble. If, if eternal life is based on how we perfectly love God and perfectly love people. The question remains, still remains, do you really love God with every fiber of your being, with your heart, with all your soul, with all your strength, with all your mind? Do you really love God with all of those? Really? Is it even possible to separate the human mind, the heart, and the soul from the affections of this life to say that we love God with all our heart, with all our soul, with all our mind, with all our strength. And likewise, do you really love people as yourself? I don't think so. Don't think only of the lovely people. Think also of the unlovely people, those that uh, you hate, especially your office mate. Sometimes you don't have a good uh, harmonious relationship with your office mate or maybe with, with your neighbor, uh, your next door neighbor. You don't have, he is always contradicting you. So it is really impossible to separate our human mind our heart and our soul from the affections of this life so that we can say that we really love God with all our heart, soul, mind, and strength. As mentioned in 1 John chapter 4, verse 20, if anyone says, I love God, yet hates his brother, he is a liar. For anyone who does not love his brother, whom he has seen, cannot love God whom he has not seen. So you can imagine, after Jesus saying that you have answered correctly, do this and you will live, you can as if imagine that there is a twinkle in the eye of Jesus. What Jesus might actually be saying is, okay, all right, I hear you. Love God, love people, sounds really good. Can you do that? Go ahead. Give it a try. Because if you can, if you can do that, you will have eternal life. As if we can imagine Jesus saying that. Because 
We cannot love people perfectly. We cannot love God perfectly. See what the expert in the law, what the lawyer does. See what he did. It just exposed his heart because he cannot live to the standards of what he had quoted. He cannot live with the standards of what he just mentioned. To love God perfectly, to love people perfectly. He cannot live with that standards that he just uh, answered. So his next question should have been, how do I do that? That should be his next question. How do I do that? But that's not it. That's not what he replied. Why? Why didn't he reply that? It's because it is written in verse 29 that he wanted to justify himself. He wanted to justify himself. That's why his, his pride, his ego uh, uh, ate him. His pride ate him. That's why he wanted to justify himself. So instead of humbling himself by saying, how do I do that? Because it could have led into a different discussion when, when he is instead asked Jesus, how do I do that? How do I love God with all uh, my heart, with all my soul, with all my strength, with all my mind? How can I do that? That should be his next question. But that is not his next question. Jesus could have taught him about grace if he should have answered, how do I do that? So his second question is, who is my neighbor? Who is my neighbor? So that is a very technical question. That is a very technical, as if it is out of premise, as if he is taking uh, uh, as much as possible, as if he is taking out the topic, the, the issue out of the topic. So he skipped many questions. The lawyer skipped many questions like how much am I supposed to love God? That is supposed to be one of his questions. How much am I supposed to love God? And how am I supposed to love God? So in those days, Jews thought that they are only obligated to help fellow Jews. That is their obligation, to help only their fellow Jews. So that was their idea of who a neighbor is. That is their idea of who a neighbor is, their fellow Jews. So going to the heart of this parable, Jesus talks about a man going down the road from Jerusalem to Jericho. Please take note that this road has a distance of 17 miles. And it descends from about 2,500 feet above sea level to about 800 feet below sea level. So from Jerusalem, Going down to Jericho, it is like a downhill, 17 miles of downhill. Can you imagine that? More than 3,000 more than 3,000 uh, feet of descent. For 17 miles, it descends 3,000 feet. So the road ran through rocky desert country which provides a place for robbers to victimize pilgrim travelers. So that's why many, many pilgrims, they, they always uh, uh, travel, they always make pilgrimage uh, when they are many because the, there's protection, there's protection in numbers. Just like in warriors, strength in numbers. Along the side, Along the side of this road is a valley, which is called the Valley of the Shadow of Death, which was referenced in Psalm 23. So that road, that 17 mile road, just beside that, just off the road is the valley. 
of the shadow of death. So since this is a very dangerous road, the man was alone and fell into the hands of robbers. He was beaten up and stripped and was left half dead. And then a priest comes along, but, the, but look at what the priest did. He passed by the other side. Why did he pass by the other side? Maybe because he's thinking that he is a priest and he cannot be ceremonially unclean. He cannot be touching the blood. He, cannot be, he, he might be dead, so he cannot touch a dead person because it will defile his hands. So maybe that's why the priest did not uh, uh, look into the uh, person, into the, the man who was uh, unconscious. And just a side note, sometimes we have to get our hands dirty to help people. We cannot have remain our hands clean. We, it, it, we should be thinking that our hands sometimes can become dirty in helping people. So the next one to pass by was a Levite. So they belong to the priestly order. A Levite belongs to the priestly order. Every priest is a Levite, but not all Levites are priests. So the Levites are responsible for the cleaning and the worship in the temple of God. So maybe he's thinking also that he, he cannot uh, make his hands dirty, just like the priest. So he had the same response as the priest went to the other side of the road. To the man, they were not compassionate. So here comes the third man came a Samaritan. We have to know that there was a long standing animosity between Jews and Samaritans. Meron pong friction. There's a friction between that, uh, between Jews and Samaritans. Let me explain. In around 730 BC, when the Assyrians came and besieged Israel, they took thousands of captives back to Assyria. And then they brought Assyrians into Israel as a way of repatriotizing the land. So they intermarried with the Jews and they settled in the land of Samaria. So their children will now be known as Samaritans. The Jews saw them with a derogatory term, derogatory term as half-breeds, half-breeds, parang mistiso or, or alangan, mga ganon, pipti-pipti. So they are neither a Jew nor an Assyrian, but they honor the first five books of the Bible and they consider themselves as Jews, even though they are not Jews. So these Samaritans, during those days, they numbered to around a million during those times. But now, they dwindled to only a few thousands. There, there are still a, a, a few thousands of, of Samaritans. Today, they live in Palestinian territories in the West Bank. But they are not Palestinians, huh? They just live in the territories, Palestinian ter territories in the West Bank. And they speak Arabic. They speak Arabic. But when they worship in a synagogue, yes, they worship in a synagogue, they speak Hebrew, the Old Testament language. That is what they speak every time they worship in a synagogue, the Samaritans. So Jesus used a Samaritan as the good guy in this passage. So 
he had compassion upon seeing this man on the side of the road. He poured wine on his wounds because wine with the alcohol is antiseptic. He also poured oil on his wounds because oil relieves pain. And then after that, he bandaged the wound. He puts the man on his own donkey, took him to an inn, and takes care of the man. He himself, huh, take note, he himself took care of the man. He is a Samaritan. And maybe the, the injured guy is a Jew. So the next day, the Samaritan gave two silver coins to the innkeeper. Spend this to take care of the man. And if you spend more than this, I will come back and repay you. And Jesus asked this second question to the lawyer in verse 36. Which of these three do you think was a neighbor to the man who fell into the hands of of the robbers. So he was asked, which do you think of these three is the neighbor to the man who fell into the hands of the robbers? So did you think, did you notice that Jesus turned everything upside down? The lawyer wants to take away the issue from the topic, but Jesus brought it back again to the issue. Jesus brought it back again. So the guy just wanted to know who is my neighbor. But Jesus said, who is the one that was neighborly to the guy? Are you being neighborly? Jesus asked, maybe Jesus was asking that. Are you being neighborly? Do you look out to the man who needs mercy? And the guy answered, the question, the one who had mercy on him. Notice that the Samaritan could not even bring himself to say the Samaritan. He could not even utter it with his lips, the word Samaritan. That's how much animosity they have towards the Samaritans. That's how much animosity. And Jesus replied and said, go and do likewise. Go and do likewise. Now, we have these three quick points about the story. We have these three quick points. We are, uh, I'm, I'm almost running out. First one, first point is, if we could love perfectly, we would be perfect. Since we cannot, we are not perfect. And therefore, we need a savior for eternal life. So Jesus is exposing the inadequacy of this man's heart to love God perfectly and to love people perfectly. And the reason is we don't know how to love perfectly. That's why we need a savior in Jesus. We don't know how to love perfectly, even though we utter with our lips that love God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind, with all your strength. Love people as you love yourself. So we cannot live up to that with what we are saying. We cannot live to that standard of what we just mentioned. So Jesus already did. That is the answer to eternal life. Jesus already did it for us when he gave up his life on the cross to die for our sins. What he wants, what Jesus wants from us is to surrender our hearts to what he has done for us, to surrender our hearts to him because of what he did when he gave his life on the cross in response to what he did when he first loved us. So it is Christ who first loved us. It is God who first loved us. We love him because he first loved us. 
So, we love God because we felt the love of God in our hearts. If we do not feel, if we do not have Jesus in our hearts, how can we feel the love of God in our hearts? So that is why we cannot manifest love because we do not have Jesus in our hearts. So we are the, Jesus is the initiator and we are just the responders. We are the responders. Jesus is the initiator. He is the giver of love. If we want to love like Jesus, we have to love Jesus. Let us remember that because we cannot love. Again, we cannot love like Jesus if we do not love Jesus. So this is where the true love will flow from in our personal relationship with Jesus. If we have personal relationship with Jesus, love will flow. It is the, it is the, the product of being saved. It is the product of having eternal life, that we can share the love that Jesus gave to us, that we felt the love of Jesus. That's why we can give, we can share the love to other people who hasn't known him yet. Secondly, second point, loving your neighbor as yourself has been elevated to the higher command to love one another as Christ has loved us. John 13, 34. If we are having problems or difficulties loving other people as we love ourselves, Jesus said in John 13, 34, a new command I give you. A new command huh? I give you. Love one another. As I have loved you, so you must love one another. So this is, this is now the new command that we must love one another. As I have loved you, you must love one another. So uh, I, I have uh, written down, maybe you can just write uh, the... Uh, these three passages that we have here, the, the first John chapter three, verse 23, first John chapter four, verse seven to eight, and first John chapter four, verse 11 to 12. Maybe we can uh, have this in our uh, uh, discussion later or in our meditation time. Please write down those, those verses. These are very important verses, very powerful verses. So why did Jesus said that this is a new commandment? Why did Jesus said when he said in John 13, 34, a new command I give you? Why did Jesus said that this is a new commandment? Because from Leviticus chapter 19, verse 18, up to this point, John 13, 34, the highest point of love man can understand is loving your neighbor as yourself. Yun po, ang, yun po ang highest love. That is the highest love that we know since we learned since we learned during those times that Leviticus 19.18 to love your neighbor as you love yourself up to this John chapter 13, verse 34, that is how we understand what love is. But now, the new command is to love one another as Christ has loved us. So that is why loving your neighbor as yourself has been elevated to the higher command to love one another as Christ has loved us. We can love like Jesus if we love Jesus because he gives us the ability and the capacity to love other people, even the unlovely people. It is a supernatural ability that comes from God's heart. 
That is the supernatural ability that we can do coming from the heart of God, that we can love people, that we can uh, love God with all our hearts, with all our mind, with all our soul, with all our strength. But we have to be careful to examine our own hearts for anything that is unloving. So we should check our hearts. Lord, what is this that is hindering me in loving people? We should be always asking that. What is keeping me from loving other people? Why do I still hate some of these people? So Jesus challenged this guy about his own personal prejudice. The Samaritan was used as an example of someone who did what was right. So the Samaritan, that's the perfect example that Jesus can use as, a, as the person who did what was right. So we should think of someone in our lives that you don't particularly like. Let us pause and think for a while about these people whom we don't particularly like. That we, yung yung parabang mabigat ang puso natin, ang dibdib natin dito sa tao. Let us think about that, huh? that person for a moment. And if God, let us think that if God used this person as the elevated individual in the story, let us say that one day, this guy that you hate, you saw him unconscious on the road. What would you do? What would it teach you? What would you do if that is the guy that you saw on the street that is unconscious, the one that you hate? We should examine our hearts that there is no prejudice, that there is no bitterness, that there is no unforgiveness in our hearts. As mentioned in Galatians chapter 3, verse 28, Paul said that there is no Jew nor Greek, slave nor free, male nor female, for you are all one in Christ Jesus. Whether you are a Jew, whether you are a Samaritan, whether you are an Ilocano, whether you are a Kapampangan, whether you are a Batangueño, we are all one in Christ Jesus. Amen. So the only way we could love people properly is to love Jesus first. And he will give us the ability to love one another as he has loved us. And finally, the third point is be that neighbor who shows mercy to those who need mercy in order to obtain mercy yourself. Be that neighbor who shows mercy to those who need mercy in order to obtain mercy yourself. So Jesus said in Matthew chapter 5, verse 7, Blessed are the merciful, for they will be shown mercy. Blessed are the merciful, for they will be shown mercy. So we need to look at every person as our neighbor. That is the key. Yun po ang susi. That we need to look at other people. No Jew, nor Greek, no Kapampangan, no Ilocano. You should be looking at every people as our neighbor. So anybody who needs mercy is our neighbor. Anybody who needs mercy is our neighbor. The beautiful thing is, if we show mercy, we will obtain mercy. This is the way God as administers his mercy to us, that if we show mercy, we will obtain mercy. May we have an eye on people who really need mercy. It is very clear, blessed are the merciful, for they will be shown mercy. So that is how God administers his mercy. Not until we show mercy to other people, 
we, we, we ourselves will not receive mercy from God. So this is a parable with eternal significance, but with practical application. Go and do likewise. Let us pray. O oh, most gracious Heavenly Father, thank you so much, Lord. Most especially for your mercy and grace that you have given us, Lord. Truly, Lord, you are the initiator, and we are just the responders, Lord. Lord, give us the willingness in our hearts, Lord, that we can be teachable by your Holy Spirit. Give us this heart, Lord, this heart of flesh. Replace our heart of stone, Father God, into a heart of flesh so that we can show mercy, that we can show love because you have first loved us, Lord. Thank you so much, Lord Jesus, for giving up your life on the cross because you have, because God so loved the world that he gave his only son, one and only son, to give up his life on the cross. And he is the atoning sacrifice for all of our sins. Thank you so much, Lord Jesus, for all the sufferings, for all the pain that you have encountered, that you have felt on the way to the cross. Thank you so much, Father God, for giving your one and only son to save all of us. And your wrath was already gone because of what Jesus did on the cross. And thank you so much, Holy Spirit, for guiding us while we are still here on earth. Thank you so much for reminding us of everything that we need to do. Thank you so much, Lord, for bringing us away from all of these sicknesses, from all of these untoward incidents that you have protected us, Lord, that you have used us as a channel of your blessing. Lord, thank you for you are truly the King of Kings. You're the Lord of Lords. You are our Savior. You are the Redeemer of our souls. And we look forward to seeing you in heaven. And while we are still here, Lord Jesus, continue to, to have our hearts cleansed, Lord, with your righteousness and with your love. Thank you so much, Father. Thank you so much. We just want to praise you, give glory to you, and give all the majesty and praises unto you. In Jesus' mighty name we pray. Amen and amen. Praise God.